Okay, welcome. Thank you all for making the long trick trip down to uh, the, this auditorium. Uh, we welcome you all. Uh, my name is Drew Sullivan. I'm the, uh, the co-founder and publisher of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And uh, let me quickly introduce the panel. So uh, let me have them introduce themselves. We'll start with Bastian. Here I am. Um, my name is Bastian Obermeier. I um, used to work for Süddeutsche Zeitung for 20 years. And then I founded Paper Trail Media, which is a our own newsroom with my colleague Frederick Obermeier, and now we are working for Der Spiegel and for ZDF, which is a public broadca broadcasting company in Germany, for Der Standard in Austria and for Tamedia in Switzerland. And I'm very thankful to be on this podium, especially because those people are representing those very important organizations that help us do worldwide investigations as newsrooms that we could not do without the guys in the middle. So uh, to start with, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, yes, thank you for having, uh, having me on board as well. Uh, my name is Laurent Richard. I'm the founder and the executive director of Forbidden Stories. Uh, our mission is to continue the work of assassinated, under threat and jailed reporters. And we do that in a collaborative uh, way. And before that, I started being uh, a journalist 25 um, years ago, uh, mostly for television, producing uh, long-form documentaries. And yeah, now we are five years old with uh, Forbidden Stories, and, and we believe a lot in collaboration. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, Honoured to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm Jared Rall. I'm the director of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Uh, we bring reporters from around the world together to do big global projects. I've been doing this for about 12 years now, and I've been an investigative reporter for about 30, which probably makes me the oldest on the panel. Hello, everyone. My name is Marina Walker. Sorry about my voice. Uh, I am <clears throat> executive editor at the Pulitzer Center, uh, an organization that supports uh, journalists working on uh, global stories. And we also bring together those journalists in specialized networks to tackle issues of uh, cross-border concern, global concern, such as supply changes of the rainforests, leading from the rainforests all the way to top brands in Europe, China, the US. Also, algorithms, we've been talking about this a lot in this conference, and uh, very soon a new network focused on oceans. But my career started at ICIJ, my, the collaborative aspect of my career. I worked there for 14 years, along with uh, Gerard and others, helping imagine how we can transform investigative journalism from a long wolf enterprise into a radical solidarity, radical sharing uh, um, enterprise uh, for the sake of the story. Not because we just like to be together, but because the story really demands this methodology and, and the extra efforts that go into uh, collaboration. So, so these are really pioneers of kind of the collaborative cross-border investigative reporting um, community. All have, uh, were seminal in, in, in critical places during the growth of this. And this has become, uh, you know, uh, quite a, uh, um, uh, I would say um, it, it has been um, imp an important element uh, of the change in journal journalism that's happened around the world. It's, it's one of the new ideas in journalism that started about 15 years ago, and it's really changed the landscape of journalism and is influencing a lot of different organizations now. And there's many, many more organizations that are out there. I see Rowan from Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism, which is another kind of collaborative cross-border organization. So there are a lot of organizations out there now, many more than 15 years ago. Um, but I felt these people have a perspective on this issue that they can give us history and they can also give us what they think is gonna go on in the future. So that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. And so let's start with um, Bastian. Bastian, of course, was part of the original Panama Papers team um, and uh, at Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, but has been a, uh, a, a, I would call him a hyper-collaborative uh, journalist uh, on investigative reporting um, and has been involved since the very beginning. So talk about a little bit about the origin story of how you got into this and um, what you see as how the industry has developed today. So when, when we started uh, working with ICHJ, with the Luxembourg leaks, for, for example, and the offshore leaks, we thought this is really extraordinary and it's, and it's fun and it's big impact. 
And the big change for us personally was when we received the Panama Papers and we explained our editors at Süddeutsche Zeitung, we like to share this with ICHA. And, and there were some voices who thought, this is completely crazy. Why would you give away a scoop, right? I mean, one guy said, we can publish this for a year and we have it exclusively. But we would have published in a, into a hole because, you know, we would have published only in German and we'd, we would have missed hundreds of stories because we, I mean, I don't know who's important um, in Hungary, for example, or, or in other countries. So, um, many stories would have died if we would have not shared uh, the data with ICHA. And so, um, we discussed that and we, we thought about it and in the end, the argument that the story itself gets so much bigger and so much more audience and that all that falls back on the medium. Like Süddeutsche Zeitung was internationally known maybe as the paper which name no one really can pronounce, like if you can try here in the room, Süddeutsche Zeitung, it's really complicated. Now, a lot of people in, in this orbit know, know Süddeutsche Zeitung for their investigative work. And I think that's fantastic for the paper, it was fantastic for us, it was fantastic for many reporters who, who joined our investigations. And, and so when the Panama Papers um, were published, I think there were thousands of singular stories that were published around the world. And if we would have um, gone alone with that, maybe we would have published 50 stories or whatever. So it's ridiculous to think that in this world, which is so globalized, one medium should do a global story, story alone. There are still some mediums who do that, like the, the biggest uh, in the world, because they have a huge audience and they think they cover all the important aspects. I think that's wrong. I think um, as soon as you've got a big story that touches more countries, you need to involve people who are actually working on the ground there. Same question for you. Yeah. Well. Thank you, Drew. Uh, now about forbidden stories and, and how we started. Uh, the, so the idea was quite simple, uh, finishing the work of journalists being killed. Uh, it was not... Uh, the first time we did it, um, in 1976, there were the Arizona project. A journalist called Don Bowles in, the, in Arizona was killed. Um, right after the killing, 30 journalists from all across the US decided to join forces to uh, continue and to finish the work that he was, he was doing. Um, um, on a personal plan, what, what, where I found the motivation, I was, uh, as I said, a journalist, a, fi a filmmaker uh, for French public TV, uh, producing investigative uh, documentaries and I was many times in the situation where I was abroad investigating international network of corruption in different countries where I was asking questions that other local journalists cannot ask otherwise they will be jailed for that. Um, I did a long form documentaries, uh, a two hours documentary called My President is on Business Trip. I was following Francois Hollande with the, the former French president and I was, he agreed to have me on, with him on his plane, traveling with him in Kazakhstan, in Azerbaijan. And my question was how you do when you are the president of France and you deal with um, dictators like Ilham Aliyev and you sign some contract about oil and gas, but you have to deal with the human rights issue in the same time. And so I was investigating that, but for the same kind of investigation, Khadija Ismailova in Azerbaijan was, was jail. And so, but I start realizing how important it is for all the journalists to ask the question that local journalists cannot ask, and how by asking the question, getting the answer when Ilham Aliyev is traveling in France, when you can ask the question, and I did the same with Erdogan in Turkey when he was visiting France to ask questions that local journalists cannot ask, the impact you might have by, by getting answer, getting information. And another thing that convinced me that was more personal to create forbidden stories was happening in 2015 on January 7 when uh, there was a terrorist attack against Charlie Hebdo, uh, uh, who was, um, um, the, the office was right next on the door of Premier Lin where uh, that was the press agency where I was working uh, for at the time. I arrived after the terrorist attack, uh, but a few minutes after the terrorists escaped the building and I saw colleagues, people were doing the same 
job of me just dying or we, we try with many people of uh, Premier Lin to help the people who were surviving. But that, that event that was so dramatic, uh, that, um, uh, that was so, yeah, a, a traumatic experience was, yeah, uh, I was in the few weeks after that trying to uh, answer this question, what I can do as a journalist after that, and, but as a journalist. And I start think, and that was a precisely at that time where I was doing my president is on business trip documentary when Khadija was jailed at that time. And I, I was also very inspired by an OCCP project called the Khadija Project as well. So all of that gave me the, the, the motivation to think about creating an organization where the mission will be very unique, where we're very focused on continuing the work of order who have been silenced. And, and, and then, yeah, the collaborative model is a perfect model for that. Why? Because collaboration brings protection. Doesn't make sense to kill reporters when you have 100 reporters working on that. You are unstoppable. So that's, and that's, uh, and, and journalists are killed for the story they just publish or they will publish. So that's how I think we are. So we have a different approach from um, uh, other organizations like CPJ, we put with at Borders, who are doing so vital and so important work, but we have a, a journalistic approach where we can defeat impunity by using journalism to defend journalism. And, and, and if we ensure the survival of the information, we can then protect the journalist. And so this is why the collaborative model is so important. More protection, more resources, uh, more value for the readers, because we are 80 to fact check any single sentence, and more impact. We can create a conversation. And the conversation we want to create is about the connection about every morning we, we, or every week we, we, we woke up in the morning and we listen to the radio show learning about the killing of a, a new killing in Mexico of a journalist. And we start to be used to that kind of metrics. It's, it became some kind of, um, in a way, some kind of metrics. And the thing that the journalist in Mexico is it sounds a very local story, but it's not only a crime committed in Mexico. It's a, it's a crime committed against press freedom, but the drug cartel that that or the politician that uh, uh, ordered the crime is working with an uh, organized crime group based in France, based in Netherlands, based in the U.S., based everywhere. So this is why it's a transnational story, and we need a network for that. So. This is how collaboration uh, for us at Forbidden Stories on this specific mission is um, so crucial. Same question. Same question. Look, this panel is about the history of collaboration, so I'm going to bring you right back to the beginning. And I know a lot of you are students, so I want to give you some good news. It's actually okay to make mistakes, and I want to talk about two mistakes that we made at the beginning that we learned from, because if you learn from a mistake, then it's no longer a mistake. Um, the first project that I came to ICIJ 12 years ago, we were a pretty small organization then. It was Marina and I and, and two others. So we didn't have any resources. And the first project that I decided we wanted to do um, was to do with um, dead corpses, actually human bodies. I had become fascinated by the fact that there were companies on Wall Street that made their and all their money basically by recycling human bodies. And, um, you know, basically if you go for uh, surgery, um, you often have bones, you know, uh, screws that are made out of human bone, you don't know this, a lot of uh, plastic surgery, um, union, no, union noses or uh, elongated penises are basically made out of recycled human skin. And this was a topic that I became kind of fascinated um, with and it had been highlighted at the time because um, this former dentist had cottoned on that if you were able to sell um, this to these companies, you can make a lot of money. And so what he'd done is he'd gone and bought a funeral home. And when people sent their relatives in there to be buried, he took the bodies into a secret cutting room, took out the long bones and skinned the bodies, and then basically buried the evidence afterwards. Um, we did a story on that where we thought it hadn't been done, even though it had been reported locally, it hadn't been done nationally or internationally. And we got a really good angle on it. We found that um, one of these corporations was actually sourcing the human bodies in Ukraine. And what it was doing was bringing the bodies from Ukraine to Germany, repackaging them as German bodies, and then bringing them in into the US for basically making these products. And we did what we, you know, most nonprofits did at the time. We, we'd hired some freelance reporters, 
they'd, they'd found this story, we thought we had a great story, and then we did what everyone did at the time, we tried to find a publisher. So I went to the Washington Post and I said, well, it's a great story. And that was the lesson that I learned. The investigations editor of the Washington Post said, how do we trust any of this reporting? We don't know who these reporters are, we don't know who you are, you're a little non-profit. And that was when I realized that you need to bring, if you're going to do collaborations, you need to bring the reporters from that organization in from the very beginning so that they actually trust the reporting. And also it solved another big problem for us because this idea of trying to find a publisher at the end was a real pain. And if you brought the reporters in from the beginning, you were guaranteed to get, to get published. Um, the second lesson that I learned, and again, making a mistake, was that I thought that if you've got to try and get people to collaborate with you, organizations, big media companies, you go to the bosses. And so I spent a long time sitting outside editors' offices around the world trying to convince them of this new model. And their attitude to me was, well, we already have foreign correspondents all over the world. Why would we want to trust you to run a story when you know, our reputation's on the line? Why would we trust you? Um, and then, again, drew, drawing from my own experience as an investigative reporter, I realized that if you give an investigative reporter a really great story, they will do anything to uh, advocate inside their newsrooms to be allowed to work on that story. And that's when we hit on the model that you go straight to the reporters, and that's what we do every time we do a big project. We bypass the editors, we go straight to the reporters, like Bastian, and he basically did all the advocacy inside his own newsroom, like he just told you, for, for the stories. So it's okay to make mistakes, but do learn from them. Okay. And I, want, I want to add one other question to you, too. If you could start to give us the context of how this fits into um, kind of the global journalism space and why it's important. You know, um, just uh, reflecting on what Gerard was saying, um, recently at the Pulitzer Center, uh, through our Rainforest Network, uh, we found ourselves with like uh, a reporter that was a stringer for the New York Times and a reporter that was a stringer for The Intercept. And these reporters became best friends, best buddies, best like co-researchers, and they got onto the same story. Uh-oh. New York Times and Intercept don't have a lot of great things to say about uh, each other, but these reporters were onto a really great story about the, what they call the airstrips of destruction. These are all the illegal runways in the Amazon that are fuel the criminal um, infrastructure that makes possible for all these commodities to come out and feed the biggest brands around the world. Uh, so we were like, what's going to happen here? And they asked us, well, should we go talk to the bosses? And we said, just do the work. Get the best, most compelling story, the story that nobody's going to be able to walk away from, even if they hate each other. And then we go talk to the bosses. And that's what they did. Uh, the talk with the bosses was still laborious, but we were able to broker that relationship, and the story came out both in the Intercept Brazil and in the New York Times, giving each other credit and giving the story the visibility locally and globally that it really deserved. Um, I want to use a little bit of my time. This is 15 years, celebration of 15 years of collaboration. And um, it seems like a long time. It's really not a long time. It seems like it was yesterday when we were turned away from newsrooms that would look at us and say, why in the world would we want to go through that nightmare of coordinating with people we don't know? Um, we can do it on our own. That was still when newsrooms were feeling a little, you know, um, the, the, maybe the, the, the full economic crisis was not on them yet. Uh, maybe they hadn't realized they needed to transform themselves digitally, and they hadn't realized that the stories that they were, uh, the stories that they were missing, because they were only looking at their national borders. So I want to use some of my time, or all of my time, to really celebrate everyone who like made possible that this happened, and to like take a stock of like how. Uh, unbelievable in some ways it has been. Uh, so give credit, <clears throat> first of all, to the reporters who believed in it, who were part of it, who were willing to leave that ego at the door, as we like to say, and to understand that to collaborate you have to cede power and you have to cede control for the sake of the story, for like some bigger good. Uh, credit to the reporters who convinced the bosses, for the bosses who talk to the publishers so they get out of the way and they don't interfere. Credit to the coordinators, to the managers, many of them women, 
that have made possible with their emotional intelligence, organizational skills and more, that this work takes place in a way that doesn't kill everyone in the process. So kudos to those persons and let's keep investing in that kind of a skill because collaborations don't just happen. They don't, they don't just happen. Otherwise it's a mess and nobody ever wants to be part of them. Kudos to the uh, people who worked on the equity issues because networks also have power dynamics. I see one here, Will Fitzgibbon, who made sure that we didn't leave behind an entire region of the world, West Africa, that those journalists whose language we don't understand often, whose culture we don't understand, were part of these efforts. And not just by inviting them, that's not enough, but by making sure often at he, with his own time and his own efforts that they were fully brought on board, that they had the training, that they had uh, the capacity, that everything that they needed, even financial resources at times, so they can be fully part uh, and succeed in the investigation. Kudos to the whistleblowers who trusted these crazy enterprises. I remember, you know, like, I, I don't know, like Bastian, that uh, your whistleblowers ever at first imagined that, you know, this would go on for 18 months and involve hundreds of people and they... Still going on, we still <laughs> use Panama Papers. I know, <laughs> exactly. But, but they wait for, before it, it came out, right? Um, so kudos to, to them for trusting the model, which I believe is very efficient uh, for them. So a lot more to do, I think, in, in the context of global journalism. It's just like an essential aspect of the work we do. It has redefined uh, also who gets to be an investigative reporter, which used to be such a restrictive and exclusive thing, right? You had to like work for 20 years. Uh, at a newspaper and show a lot of potential in order to be named an investigative reporter. And now, you know, these networks are, are amazing equalizers that allow people who are hungry for the story, who show the skills, who show the collaborative, um, you know, uh, intention and uh, an attitude to be part of stories that, that really can change the world. So I'm, I'm moderator, but I also have to represent OCCRP here uh, at the table. Um, so OCCRP fa was founded in about 2006. Um, and at the time, the old ICIJ 1.0 had shut down. Um, and, and there was really nobody doing collaborative work around the world. And we started actually, um, we, we, we didn't start as an organization. We started because Paul Radu and I needed LexisNexis. So we started a company that could hire LexisNexis and, and, and then give it to each of us so we didn't have to pay so much money. Um, and we, we realized, wow, that's really convenient, so we bought our insurance through that company. Uh, and then we started doing everything that neither of us could afford through that company. Um, and we applied for a grant from the UN called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And we never even named our organization. Um, it just that, that project name of the, the grant became the name of the organization because we'd referred to it as that OCCRP money. Um, and that actually, so, so, so we, we, it's just been an organic growing thing and it was just incredibly useful. And, and, and the tool was finding local reporters. Back then, Eastern European reporters where we started had a name, they were called stringers or they were called fixers. Um, which was quite insulting to these amazing investigative reporters who knew more about their country than any other journalist. And what we wanted to do is bring them together, unlock them, and, and to, to give them the resources they needed to do great work. And many of them have worked on the projects from, from these partners um, in, on some of the great projects. Um, you know, they're, they're truly amazing journalists, uh, but they get forgotten uh, in the Western journalism mindset. And so OCCRP really has defined itself now as an organization that builds kind of a collaborative cross-border working space. We provide tools, we provide funds, we provide expertise, we provide security, we provide data, we provide data tools, we provide all the things that you need as a small organization to basically do a, a global project if you have a great idea. And so a lot of the stories are bottom up as opposed to other organizations. And, and we spend a lot of time um, helping these organizations, curing, sustaining. Many of the organizations in the OCCRP network were started by 
by us from journalists who worked on collaborative stories and then wanted to start a, uh, a center themselves. Anushka Delic in the front row here was Slovenia. Um, she's one of them. You know, uh, I Stories, we were the first fiscal sponsor of the Russian organization. And so we helped really provide the money and the resources to get a lot of these organizations started. And so that's really what OCCRP sees its mission on. Um, and the, the collaborative cross-border space has allowed cheaper, better, faster stories. It's allowed journalists in other countries to find expertise and to find depth and context that they could never get um, from doing it remotely. The concept of the foreign correspondent is in many ways dead. Um, we don't need them anymore. We have those great journalists out there. People just need to connect to that network and use them. But we face a lot of problems going forward and there's a lot of challenges in this industry. So Bastian, talk about the future, where you think things are going and the challenges and opportunities we might have and then we'll open this up for the audience. So try to keep it a little bit brief. <laughs> okay, um, so, so the biggest challenge that, that we had in the last years were that uh, in, in a really rich country like Germany still we, we, we only had limited possibilities to do the, the, the work as we wanted to do it. So we would have liked to do more long-term investigations internationally. We would have liked to contribute more to certain projects. I remember the Martinez project where, where we as Süddeutsche Zeitung didn't do any reporting actually. We just took the story and we published it somehow. Um, so while Süddeutsche is a, is a wonderful place to work, um, they had the same problems as most big media organizations nowadays, so the money gets less, right? So what we decided um, when we founded Papertail Media is that, that we wanted to focus on, on this kind of investigations. We wanted to get rid of the daily work, we wanted to get, get rid of the weekend shifts. We just wanted to do the work that we thought is really important and that we thought can also get really good results and get can also fascin fascinate uh, people, you know, not only in readers of newspapers, but also in TV, but also on radio, but also digitally. So, um, so our new model of paper trail media is that we do one investigation with those guys, with their help, with, with their knowledge, um, with many other reporters in the world. And then we say, this is our next story, and then we are speaking with our partners like the Spiegel and ZDF, the Standard, the Media. Who of them would be interested in which part of the story? And then, when we already did the work, mostly we divide the stories and we fill into the different um, audience spaces that they got. And we think this is a model we hope We'll see, actually. <laughs> we hope, we started a year ago, we hope this is a model where you can still have those long-term investigations without having to cut away too much for, for daily stuff that, you know, newspapers have to do. When we worked on the Panama Papers, we didn't publish a single article for, for a year, something like that, on a daily newspaper. So you can imagine how our colleagues reacted to that. I mean, when, when, when they met me on the, on the, uh, in the building, they asked me if I lost my job or what I was doing f f for a living now because I did not write like everyone else, right? So um, that's really something that, that we, we all need to have. We need the time. Big investigations, large international inv investigations need many reporters, need time, and we think that our model can help us to do all the work with those guys. And and just to add something about uh, future and challenges, I think there is, uh, f first to say that n not all the stories need a collaboration. Uh, you, most of the stories, actually, you can do that alone with your own newsroom. And so the, then the question about when do I need a collaboration, when do I need to add one partner or 100 partners or 300 partners, it depends on many factors when it's about a leak that is uh, speaking for, for all the humanity, for all the world, because it's about tax avoidance, because it's about criminal activities, when it's about a dangerous topic that you need to team up to, to bring protection, when it's about the expertise that you don't have. Uh, for instance, we collaborate on the Pegasus project with Amnesty International Security Lab, 
uh, with the expertise on the NSO group on the Pegasus spyware. And that's interesting to see also um, the, the kind of collaboration we're talking about. We can collaborate from journalist newsroom, but also with NGO, we can provide some kind of very precise expertise, technical support to help the journalist to, to advance. But I think regarding the challenges in the future, uh, something that is interesting is about so we, we, we speak a lot about the lone wolf reporter uh, model. So how to convince people to be on board, how to share your information. There is a question about the and, um, responsibility of school of journalism in, in that. I think we really need more, much more school of journalism. We can really teach collaborative journalism as, as, a, as a real thing from the very beginning, and, and I think that's important. Uh, we need as well, um, of course, to convince on uh, news organization to be part of that and to see sometimes we, um, the challenge that we do have at Forbidden Stories is to identify the potential national connection with a partner. And sometimes you don't need a national connection because the story is so powerful that you, 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 you should be part of that. So there is a, a sort of question of uh, transforming the culture of why you are on board on such a collaborative project, why the story matters, uh, wh whether or not you have a national um, um, connection. And of course, there is a question of the funding and the support and the investment that you, w w what is the best business model for that? Most of us relies on grants, on philanthropic and, 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 and and those kind of collaboration, uh, the key of the success of that is the time you can have, have to, va to, to that, the security assessment. In our case, all the investigation we are doing are very dangerous. One journalist has been killed, the killer is still free, and, and, and the investigation will be dangerous. So the risk assessment part is, um, is very key uh, as well. So that's some of the points I think are very important to discuss for, for the future. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to stick to one thing, and that's a, it has to be driven by the story rather than funding. I mean, we all talk about funding when we're non-profits, and we all actually rely on foundations and individuals to give us money. I think one of the reasons why ICJ has been successful is we actually put the story at the center of everything, and that pulls the train. Um, there are loads of challenges out there at the moment. I mean, I think the biggest challenge we have is a general challenge for journalism. We need to be believed. I and mean, it's very hard now to sift through everything and to, and to really understand what is important and what isn't important, what's real, what isn't real. I mean, we're, we're about to head into a whole AI, artificial intelligence world where it's going to become even more confusing. I mean, when we first got the internet, we, we started getting that, that static and that extra information. I mean, the challenge for us these days as journalists is actually making sense of that information. And I think it's important we don't forget to stick to the principles of journalism, which is to really verify facts. And one point I'll make about collaboration, and I think it's something that's very important, you can bring a lot of nuance to a story when you have 600 reporters all looking at the same set of facts through different sets of eyes and different cultural perspectives. It's actually really difficult for anyone at the end to say that you, had, you were biased in any way. And I think it's very believable journalism. And I think we need to stick to, you know, we need to really emphasize that point. But to your point, not every story requires a collaboration. And I think the biggest danger here is that we're doing too many uh, collaborations on the stories that don't need it, and newsrooms will eventually get tired of the stories not having the kind of impact that Panama Papers had, or Par Paradise Papers, or Pandora Papers, or you know, Implant Files, and, and they start getting tired. They go back to what I was talking about at the beginning. Why do we need the collaboration? And they'll go, you know, they basically shrink inside their newsrooms again and decide that they're going to do it themselves. Um. <clears throat> I think uh, one of the, the, the issues that we have is like we now, I wouldn't say that it's a saturation of collaboration or, or networks because in my view the more the merrier, uh, but maybe we have more collaborative, collaborative stories, initiatives and networks than journalists out there, are out there that are willing or, or have the skills to, to join and so we all tend to go to the same people, right? And so in some way there's a little bit of a click. Uh, and so the, the challenge is like, how do we continue to expand this methodology, whether it's from university, whether it's you know, in, in different uh, ways, so we can include beat reporters, we can include uh, younger reporters, uh, we can include the students from the beginning you know, uh, of their careers. And, um, uh, and, and also, that also solves the problem that 
journalists faced. I was talking uh, to some colleagues here at the conference and they feel we have this uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. We feel like if, uh, if we say no to a collaboration, we might not be called again. Or what if we miss, if this one is the one that is gonna be the, uh, win the big prize or, or get the real bad guys. Um, and what I would like to encourage reporters uh, to think very carefully about uh, their strategy not just what the, the strategy of the network is, but what is their local strategy, what is the strategy of their own organization, what are the stories that are more relevant to their audiences, and learn to say no. It's very liberating, because then any time you say no to something, then you can fully say yes to a story, to a collaboration that can be very transformative for, for your work. So don't feel FOMO. Instead, uh, let's feel, uh, what is JOMO, joy of missing out. <laughs> <laughs> So joy of missing out is a good thing as well. And the other thing is like as more people, as we welcome more people into the collaborative space, now is the new normal. Um, let's remember that we have to do the hard work, that we have to manage those collaborations, that if people experience ca chaos when they come to a collaboration, we are going to be expelling and pushing people out and we are going to be undoing all the hard work that many of the people here have been doing for a long time. So invest in coordination, invest in communication, and be very careful uh, about picking your partners. There's also a joy of saying no to certain partners that you know maybe were not made for, for being in a team. And there are some wonderful journalists that have come to us. I remember one French journalist that one time they said, listen, I love ICIJ, but I also love being a lone wolf, so please let me be a lone wolf. <laughs> I'll cheer you from my cave. And I, I thought that that was wonderful. So let's embrace who we are um, and let's try to preserve this beautiful space that has been created through the effort of many uh, by adhering to the principles that made it, especially in the first place, and by not reproducing in the collaboration the power dynamics and the hierarchies uh, that Drew was mentioning that were so um, harmful uh, in, in traditional reporting. Yeah, and I, I think I, I have a, you know, I think this has really changed the way we do journalism in a lot of ways. And I think collaborations are getting smaller. I mean, the Panama Papers, you know, 600 reporters, you know, I think now, you know, 20 and 30 and even 10 and, and 5 reporters, we, you know, OCCRP has always had smaller collaborations because every story we do is a collaboration and it's often between just a couple countries, um, you know, but, um, you know, we, we love to work on the big projects as well, um, but, but, you know, it, it sometimes is more effective to smaller places and then and then do it in stages. So you do a small story in a region, and then you 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 make that bigger. You globalize that story, you know. So so it really is important. And it's changed the type of people we hire. We actually look for hyper collaborative reporters. You know, people can communicate very effectively and can work well with others, and no assholes. You know, we just have to eliminate the people that cause problems and, and, and issues. But I guess one of my longer term concerns is that, you know, this works because we have people everywhere. Um, you know, between the networks that are up here and between the networks sitting in the seats, you know, almost every country on earth is covered by, by some network. Um, but increasingly, and that's the strength of collaborative journalism, is to have that expertise in Togo, you know, to have that expertise in Benin, where somebody knows the person at the, at the ministry and can get the records. Um, and that makes us so powerful. Um, but in many places, you know, journalism is really extremely difficult to, to practice right now. And increasingly, we deal with, you know, having to move reporters out of countries to other countries. We've, we've had that on two or three occasions, um, but we have a number of other occasions that are borderline. And as you, you lose the reporters in those countries, it becomes increasingly difficult to do this work. And so I spend a tremendous amount of my, my time on lawsuits. Our network has 49 lawsuits against it. I spend a tremendous amount of time on safety of journalists. Um, you know, large organizations that come in and hire people as stringers don't care whether they're, you know, what safety problems they have, they consider it their local problem. You know, we try to concern ourselves with, you know, if we're asking somebody to do work, it's our obligation to protect them. It's our obligation to keep them safe. Um, and that takes a tremendous amount of time. So the job has gotten increasingly complex, um, you know, but 
we think that, you know, I think that this has been a golden age in many ways. It's the golden age of leaks, it's the golden age of collaboration, it's the golden age of investigative reporting. And so all of this is, is worth it to get these great stories that these incredible journalists have, have done. So I want to stop there and I want to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, so there's people with microphones, uh, just to attract their attention, they'll bring a mic over and, uh, and give it to you. So there's one over here, yep. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Hi, I'm Dominique Thierry. I'm the consultant for an EU-funded program supporting independent journalism. And uh, I'm really humbled by the presence of so distinguished uh, organization there and by the work that is being done in collaborative journalism uh, in supporting investigative journalism. A question regarding the outreach. It's surely collaborative journalism has helped a lot getting the stories out. Uh, researching the stories, finding out the proper journalists to do, to do the work, etc. But what about reaching out to the audiences? We see a lot of fatigue. We see a lot of stories uh, reaching with limited amount, account uh, and impact uh, the, the targeted audiences. Isn't there a way of using this collaboration also for the delivery of a story, making sure that its impact is stronger thanks to the best practices that some journalists, some outlets in one country may have that could be imitated, copied uh, in another country. Isn't that there somewhere where peer-to-peer -peer could help in reaching out stronger to, to audiences? And let's take one more question too. Is there a second question? Wow, you guys are passive. <laughs> uh, there's one back there. We're investigative reporters. Come on, ask tough questions. Yeah. <laughs> We have a, there we go. It, yeah, it works. Um, I'm Robert, I'm a journalism student from Netherlands. Um, I was asking, I want, I want to ask how can we bring journalism schools into collaborations? How can they become a part of this? I can answer maybe the first question, I don't know. Um, but on, on the first question that is very important, just talking about um, the question about how to increase the reach, how to in, how to reach out to some audience uh, globally in a very efficient way, just based on on our latest uh, investigation called the the Raphael Project. Uh, four days ago, we published the Raphael Project. That was an investigation that we we continue the work of Rafael Moreno, uh, a Colombian journalist who has been killed in last October, uh, so six precisely six months ago. And, and so Raphael was in touch with us, has shared with us through the Safebox network his ongoing investigation and, asked, and was explaining what, 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 what he was investigating, threats he was receiving, and asked us to continue his work in case he was killed. And he was killed seven days after that. Right after we went to Colombia, we set up a coalition of news organization, but two kinds of, um, of groups were created at that time, a group that were of Colombian journalists, South American journalists, international journalists who were on the field investigating in Monte Libano, in Puerto Libertador, in Bogota, the leads that Rafael was investigating. He was investigating a mining company. He was investigating um, stories of corruption around two, clan, two family clans over there. And then we set up also as, as well a network of publishers who, were, who agreed to republish the stories of all journalists at Forbidden Stories and the, and, and the stories produced by the, 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 the network. And then that's a very interesting model because the story of, Raphael, of the Raphael Project, the outcomes, the findings, and we find many things, were published by Rappler in Philippines, by Irish as well, in Folia in Brazil, uh, from The Guardian as well. So it was a way to expose and to find a, a way to a, a, a new collaborative model between people in the field, people republishing, who are just not republishing, but they are really part of the conversation we are in, the, in, the, in the way we are editing the, the story. So that's a so way, and one thing that we are doing, we are so 
trying to reach out to all the audience that are maybe th uh, not the one reading the, the page of the of the Le Monde, the Washington Post, through documentaries, through some platform where we can tell the story in another way to reach out in uh, another way. I just wanted to, to add that uh, we have to acknowledge that a lot of the audiences that most need these stories and that we most need are not reading journalism. They are not reading newspapers. They are not reading uh, the stories we do. And so one of the things in you know, acknowledging this reality is that we are trying to do at the Pulitzer Center is to find once the stories are out, to uh, work across disciplines, to co-opt other disciplines, to find ways to express the investigative stories in different mediums. So we're doing alliances with artists, we're doing analysis with graphic novel writers, um, we're doing alliances with schools and universities in places like the Congo Basin, the Amazon, Southeast Asia, uh, to conv and with influencers. I never imagined in my life that I would do something like that. And with the influencers, it's not about paying them, don't pay them, it's about convincing them to use their substantial uh, followers and influence for good to convince them, to show them with great compelling stories that have great characters and brands that are recognizable, that they can, that they can be cool, like they like to be, while helping um, forward, move forward these important topics. Uh, so that's, for us, is like a lot of the work at the upfront on the network, and then a lot of the work once the story is out to engage audiences through expressions that might touch their emotions uh, more than the 8,000 word story might. Yeah, I mean, I think we tackle the idea of audience through scale. Um, you know, at that first project that I mentioned 12 years ago, we had about eight reporters working on it. By the time we had done Pandora Papers, we were working with 600 reporters and 170, you have to think about this, 117 different countries, 150 media partners. It's impossible to ignore that story. When Panama Papers happened, well, we brought down three governments, uh, three uh, and you know laws were changed in multiple countries i think we published pandora within days the czech prime minister had been thrown out of office um i i, I think it's impossible to ignore those stories and i think that that's how we tackle it through scale but also i think you're also seeing a huge um trail from these stories that are going on. I mean, we just published a story on the seventh year anniversary of the Panama Papers, and there are like 16 pop songs that have now named Panama Papers as a racehorse called Panama Papers. Um, the best-selling novel in the world right now is a, a novel by David Baldacci, who's a best-selling crime novelist, and it's based on the Pandora Papers and the, and the Panama Papers. That's very important because it's actually getting into every aspect of society. I mean, Bastian will know there was a Hollywood ma movie made out of, out of Panama Papers. That's how you can get journalism to, to really, I mean, people may not read the story, but they'll remember, they'll read the book or they'll, they'll hear the pop song. and you know, they associate that with the message we want to get across, which is, this is something that really needs to change. You know, this is bad things, and you need to be angry about it. So I'll take on the question about universities. Um, you know, it's, it's, universities tend to be a little bit behind everything. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, but I, I think you will, they also do jump on trends. And I think you will start to see universities include some of this collaborative stuff. You know, we, we are in discussions with universities about, you know, working together. And we also hire interns specifically to try to get people from, from universities involved in this process at an early stage. And, and those people have done very well when they've, they've left OCCRP. Um, unfortunately, we get about 300 applications a year for about five positions. Um, so so it, it's difficult to, to meet as much of the needs as possible. Um, but I would suspect that you will see, as, as, as Laurent mentioned, you know, he's interested in getting something going in university. We're planning on doing it. I don't know if ICIJ is, but you know, there will be more opportunities at the university level. In the meantime, you as an individual young journalist um, just basically be a pain in the butt and, and don't, you know, what I find is if, if people don't keep asking enough times, I'm, they're not in, inquisitive enough or aggressive enough to get my attention and therefore I'm not going to hire them. Um, and so, you know, be a pain in the butt and try to get an internship somewhere. Um, we don't really have time for any more questions, but I'm going to give the panel a last um, opportunity to say anything they would like to say on this she topic. She says that there's time for one more. One more, okay. 
We have one more question. Hi, uh, I'm Luis. Uh, I run a nonprofit news organization in Brazil. Uh, my question is to Drill. Uh, you mentioned lawsuits, many lawsuits. What's your advice for uh, new organizations? If we lose one lawsuit, we are done. So what should we do to avoid that? And what yeah. are you doing now? So, so, so uh, we're, we're building a thing called Reporter Shield, which will be an insurance company. Um, for journalism organizations, for small journalism organizations. Um, and you can get a, um, some insurance at a very cheap price, um, and it will help you to be able to withstand those lawsuits. Um, that's the best thing we've got for now, other than have your stories incredibly well researched, very well fact checked, and very well lawyered before you send them out, so that if you do get into a lawsuit, um, that you're going to win it, um, and then to look for the current um, uh, programs that are out there from Media Defense and some of the other organizations out there that provide support for lawsuits. But there's too many stories having been self-censored right now because this is an existential question for small news organizations. But hopefully in, in July, I mean June 1st, you can apply for um, Reporter Shield uh, media insurance if you're a small organization. Okay, are we... That's it. Okay. Unfortunately, we have to stop. Thank you all for coming and thank this wonderful panel for their uh, amazing contributions and for their discussions today. Thanks, Peter.